Functional fixedness, a phenomena introduced by Carl Duncker which describes a cognitive bias that limits a person to using an object only in the way it is traditionally used. This reflects a kind of mental block against recognizing an item's potential uses aside from its common function. Functional fixedness can be found in everyday objects such as a plastic bottle, which is usually a container for liquids such as water, however it can also be converted into a plant watering system or a bird feeder. Now this phenomena can also be extended into the world of software engineering, and in the context of this video, a popular style sheet language called CSS. CSS was initially designed to style and lay out web pages within two-dimensional space. As its capabilities expanded to include 3D transformations, those who were accustomed to using CSS only for 2D styling might have experienced some kind of functional fixedness, not recognizing or leveraging the full potential of CSS for creating three-dimensional visual effects. For those of you unfamiliar with CSS's applications within a three-dimensional world, in this video we'll be looking at just that. The first part is where we will look at how we can rotate and translate objects within three-dimensional space. We will create an abstract representation of a layout where it will first rotate, then the components will pop out, and finally have the whole thing rotating infinitely. In the second part, we'll be looking at how we can create 3D shapes and then animating those. The concept will be a cube within a cube where both will be rotating in different directions. When we hover over the smaller cube, it will smoothly scale up in size and then back down once we take the cursor off. And yes, we will exclusively be using HTML and CSS. If you want to see the code in its final form, feel free to check out the code pen below. Now this video is sponsored by Snapify, so if you want to animate your code snippets similar to how I do it on my channel, go ahead and follow the link in the description and literally bring your code to life. Okay, so to begin with, I've already gone ahead and added some boilerplate code so that we don't need to worry about positioning. For example, this container which we will be reusing for our two animations. For the first animation, let's have a look at what we have. Overall, we have eight shapes that first rotate and then separate. The first shape to separate is the main border from the body of the object. Then the upper left rectangle moves away followed by the square and then the larger rectangle. So we can start off by focusing on the first part, which is the border coming away. Inside of the index.html file, we can add the class diagram to our section and then two divs. The first div will have the class side and front and the second div to have the classes side and back. The first div will represent the front body and the second will be the border that separates. Inside of the CSS file, we can start by creating the class side, which will have position set to absolute, then width and height set to 380 pixels. As for the element that has the side and front classes, we can set the background to be dark greyish with the RGB values of 30, 30 and 30 and finally an alpha value of 0.8 so that we have some transparency. We can also give it a dash border of 1 pixel and a border colour of lightish grey with an opacity of 0.8 just so it has some detailing. As for the content that we place inside of it, we can give that a padding of 1.5 rem, a display of flex, justify content to be spaced between and a flex direction of column. As for the div that has classes side and back, we can give that a border of 2 pixels solid and a color of RGB 175, 175 and 175, along with a padding of 1.5 rem so that it fits well with the side front. Ok, we have the front and back set up, now might be a good time to work on the first animation which will rotate the whole object along the x and y axis. At the top of the CSS file, I'm going to add in an at rule called keyframes which is a rule that lets us create animations by defining what should happen to certain properties of an element at different points during the animation. You can think of keyframes like a script for a movie where you specify key scenes and CSS will fill the action between those scenes smoothly. For this one, we'll give it the name full body rotation and set the starting properties within the from. Whatever we place in here is how the element will look at the start of the animation. We can add transform and set rotate y to be 0 degrees and rotate x to be 0 degrees. Underneath the from, we can add a to, which is where we can specify what the animation will look like at the end of the sequence. For this, we can say that transform will be a rotation on the y axis of minus 35 degrees and rotate 25 degrees on the x axis. Now that the animation keyframes have been defined, we now need to apply them. We could add it to the container class, however, we will also be using that class for the second animation of this tutorial. We did, however, add the class diagram, so let's use it there. Underneath the container class, we can implement the class diagram. Then set the animation property where we can add in full body rotation, give it a duration of 1.5 seconds and a transition type of ease in out. This easing ensures that it starts off slow, speeds up and then slows down towards the end, all within the 1.5 seconds we set. 
Looking at the preview, we can see how the rotation animation is working. However, once the animation ends, it snaps back to its original position. To fix this, we can add forwards, which will ensure that the object stays in the last position we assigned it within the keyframes. Let's also add a delay so that it doesn't start the moment the page loads. We can set it to be half a second. The next animation we want is to separate the back from the front. The way this will work is that the back will move across the negative Z axis. Back at the top where we have our full body rotation keyframes, we can define another one and name it separation back. For the starting keyframe, we'll set transform to be translate Z zero pixels. And then for the final frame, set transform to be translate Z minus 75 pixels. Now for a quick overview on the axis of our shape. Our animation starts with the Y axis going vertically up and the X axis running horizontally and the Z axis coming directly towards us. We then rotated the axis by minus 35 degrees on the Y and 25 degrees on the X, which put our entire axis in the following position. In the second animation, we've stated that we want the back to move along the negative of the Z axis. It's also important to remember, up until now, we've only been using the X and Y axis, or two dimensional space. With the use of translate Z, we are breaking into the third dimension. Back down where we have the side back classes, we can include the animation property and set that to separation back with duration of one second, an ease of ease in out and forwards so that the back does not snap back once the animation is finished. Then underneath an animation delay of 2.5 seconds. But when we actually preview this, nothing new seems to be reflected. The back still seems to be fitted to the front. Well, that's because we haven't really told CSS that we want our translations to be preserved within three dimensional space. To do that, we need to go to the parent element of our div, which will be container, and set the property transform style to be preserve 3D. The preserve 3D value specifies that the child elements should be positioned and respected within 3D space. Now, I have added this to the container and not the diagram, as this will also be needed for the second part of the tutorial when we create the cube. The other thing to know is that when the back moves away, there seems to be no change in depth, meaning in a real three dimensional world, it would look as if it was moving away from us. The great thing is, is that CSS gives us the option to add that to our 3D elements. We can add the property perspective, which determines how far elements are away from the user in 3D space. A low value such as 500 pixels will make the 3D effect more pronounced as it simulates the viewer being closer to the objects. Whereas higher values create a subtler 3D effect as objects appear further away. In this case, 2000 pixels seems just about right. Okay, we now have the first few animations out of the way and have also implemented our first bit of 3D CSS. Now let's start to add the rectangles that pop off from the front. The first thing that we need to do is ensure that the side front also preserves our 3D transformations. Now, because we added it to the container, this does not necessarily mean that the children will inherit it. To ensure that they do, we can add transform style inherit to the side front classes. Then inside of the HTML file, within the first div element, we can add a header tag and then provide it with a class header. This will hold the top rectangles that we saw in the demo. Within the header, we can add two divs that have the class shape. Within the first one, we can add another set of divs. Give the first one the classes rectangle MD and body. For the sibling div underneath it, the classes rectangle MD and border. For the second div, we can do something similar. We can give it two divs, with the first one to have the classes square and body, then for the second div to give that the classes square and border. Underneath the header, we can add our last div that will take the class shape. Within that, two divs with the first having the classes rectangle LG and body, as for the second one to have the classes rectangle LG and border. Back inside of our CSS file, at the bottom we can add the class header and provide it with the properties display set to flex, flex direction to be row, justify content to be space between, align items to be center, and transform style to inherit, so that it also preserves within three dimensions. As for the shape class, we can also set transform style to be inherit. For the body class, we can set that to have a background color of lightish gray with the value 175 for R, G and B and then alpha value of 0.8. We can set top and left to be 50% and transform to be translate minus 50%, minus 50%. This is so that the body and the border that we will add to our shapes are aligned vertically and horizontally, given that the body will also have a position of absolute. 
As for the border class, we can give the property border the values of two pixel weight, dashed and RGBA with the values 75, 75, 75 and 0.7 for alpha. Now that we have the blueprint for our rectangles out of the way, let's start by defining the one called the rectangle MD. We can give that a height of 70 pixels and a width of 280 pixels. Recalling the final result, the body of the rectangles pop out soon after the back separates from the front. This means that we will need another set of keyframes that we can apply to the rectangles. At the top of the CSS file, where we have our other keyframe, we can create a new one called separation body. For starting position, we can set the transform to be translate Z with zero pixels and another translate that will hold minus 50%, minus 50%. The reason we need that last translate is so that it doesn't override the translate we added to the body class. As for the two section, we can set transform to be translate Z by 60 pixels and keep the same translate minus 50% function. Back down the file, we can add rectangle MD body to have the animation separation body, a duration of 0.2 seconds, ease in, out and forwards. Then underneath that, an animation delay set to 3.25 seconds. When we preview it, we can see how our rectangle now pops out. For the final shape within the header, we can add in the class square and set the height and width to be 70 pixels, and then have the square body to have the animation separation body with a duration of 0.2 seconds, ease in, out, and forwards. However, this time we can set the animation delay to be 3.4 seconds so that it starts just before rectangle MD finishes. Okay, that's the header shapes taken care of. We just need to implement the larger rectangle. For that, we can add the class rectangle LG and give it a height of 250 pixels and width of 100%. The problem is, is that the body overlaps the border on the left, so we will need to make a slight adjustment. Inside of the rectangle large body, we can set the margin left to be two pixels, which is the same as the weight of the border. Cool, perfectly aligned as all things should be. The next thing we need is for this rectangle to be animated. So we can add the animation property and provide it with separation body, 0.2 seconds, ease in, out, and forwards, and the delay to be 3.6 seconds. Looking at our 3D CSS animation, we now have the rotation and then the back separates from the front. Once that's done, the rectangles separate, leaving only an outline of where they once existed. The final animation for this is to set the rotate infinitely. So back at the top, where we have our keyframes, we can create a new one called full spin where we can have transform to start with rotate Y minus 35 degrees and rotate X to be 25 degrees. The same values as the final frame of our first rotation animation. For the two section, we can set transform to be rotate Y 360 degrees and another rotate Y to be negative 35 degrees and rotate X to be 25 degrees so that it transitions smoothly without snapping back every time one loop finishes. Then back in the diagram class, we can include full spin. Set that to 20 seconds, making the easing linear and the repeat to be infinite. The easing linear means that the speed of the animation will be distributed equally throughout the animation sequence. We now have our first 3D animation built completely from CSS. It's now time to turn our attention towards the next 3D CSS animation. This time we'll be creating a 3D shape and animating that. This example will be a cube within a cube, with them rotating in different directions and with different easings. Furthermore, when the cursor hovers over the smaller blue one, it will scale smoothly in size. So let's begin. We can start off by jumping into the HTML and at the bottom, underneath our last section, we can add a new one and then provide it with a class container. Then within that, a div that holds a class cube. This will represent exactly that. We can also give it the class big as this one will represent the bigger cube in our animation. Now recalling from what we learned back in elementary school, we know that a cube has six faces. Taking that as inspiration, we can go ahead and define six divs within the cube. For the first one, we can give that the classes face and front. Then for the second one, face and back. Then face and left. For the fourth, face and right. Then finally, face top and face bottom. Back inside of the CSS file, we can go down to the bottom and define a cube class, where we can give that a display of flex, justify content to be center, place items to be center, and position to be relative. Then for the face class, we can set that to have a width of 200 pixels, a height of 200 pixels, a position of absolute, and a border that has a weight of 2 pixels solid and an RGBA holding 175, 175, 175 and 0.7 for alpha. Great, we can now see a square. In fact, these are all the six faces that we added within the HTML, just all facing us. Let's go ahead now and move the front face closer to us. 
For the div that has the class's face and front, we can set transform to be translate Z by 100 pixels. Hmm, okay, not much of a visual difference. How about we go ahead and rotate the cube slightly on the Y axis by minus 40 degrees and on the X by minus 20 degrees. Still no difference. Ah, wait, remember we need to make sure that CSS knows that we want to operate within 3D space. So we can add the transform style property to the cube and set that to preserve 3D. Okay, better, but it's still hard to tell. Why don't we add a color to face front so that it's easier to tell what we're looking at. Let's now create the face back in a similar way. This time we can set transform to be rotate X minus 180 degrees on its own axis, basically flipping it and then translate Z by 100 pixels and give it the color blue. Then for the left face, we can rotate it by minus 90 degrees on the Y and translate it by 100 pixels on the Z axis, whilst also giving it a background color of green. Now keep in mind that when we rotate it, we're also rotating the entire axis of the left face. Hence, why moving it along the Z axis is different to when we did it with the back face. The right face, we can do the same thing, but just rotate it by 90 degrees on the Y axis instead and give it the color yellow. Then for the top face, we can rotate that by 90 degrees on the X axis and translate it on the Z axis by 100 pixels with a background color of pink. Okay, we just need to add in the bottom face. Just so we get a good visual, we can go back up to the cube class and set rotate X to be positive 20 degrees. Then back down, we can add in the classes that have both face and bottom to have transformation of rotate on the X by negative 90 degrees and translate Z to have 100 pixels and give it a background color of orange. Congratulations, you've just created a cube using plain old CSS. But now that we have it set up, we can get rid of our helper colors and remove the transform from our cube class so that our cube is facing us directly. Let's then add some depth to the cube by setting the perspective property to be 6,000 pixels. You can see how the cube starts to head towards a vanishing point, but only slightly. Okay, let's now animate it. For that, we can go ahead and create a set of keyframes called Big Cube Spin. This animation will have the cube spinning back and forth, but this time, instead of the from and to blocks, we can split the animation up using percentages. We can say that at the beginning, signified by the 0%, the transformation will have rotate Y to be 0 degrees and rotate X to be 0 degrees. We can then say we want the state to end using the 100% block. At transform rotate Y, 0 degrees, and rotate X to be 0 degrees. Between the start and finish, at the halfway point, as stated using the 50% block, we want the transformation to be rotate Y 360 degrees and rotate X to be negative 360. The great thing with these percentage blocks is that we can set different points throughout, such as 20% or even 76%. We can then apply this by adding it to the div that holds both cube and big, as we won't be applying it to the smaller cube that we will be creating in a moment. We can set the animation to be big cube spin with a duration of four seconds an ease of ease and in an infinite loop. We can now see the big cube spin by rotating along the X and Y going backwards and forwards. Let's now go ahead and add in the smaller cube. Back inside of the HTML file, we can add another div and give it the classes cube and small. Then copy the six faces from the last one and paste them in. Already we can see the second cube facing directly at us whilst the other one is spinning. However, we want this one to be smaller in size, so to do that we can include the classes cube and small, and then set scale to be 0.4. Okay, it's smaller now. How about we change the color to jazz it up a bit? Underneath the face class, we can use a combinator and say that if the face is a child of the class small, then set the background color to be blue, with RGBA values 00255 and an alpha value of 0.1, so we have some transparency. That's the color sorted. Next we need to animate it. We can do something similar to what we did with a big cube and create keyframes called small cube spin. Then for the beginning, we can set transform to be rotate Y zero degrees and rotate Z to be zero degrees. Then at the halfway point, we can say that the rotation on the Y axis will be minus 360 degrees and positive 360 degrees on the Z. Finally, for the last keyframe, we can set it to rotate Y zero degrees and rotate Z to be zero degrees. Then heading back down to cube small, we can set animation to be small cube spin with a duration of eight seconds, linear easing and loop set to infinite. Cool, we now have the smaller cube spinning. The final touch I guess we'll add is some cursor interaction. We can have it so that when the cursor hovers over the small cube, it scales smoothly up in size. So for that we can say cube small colon hover 
scale will be 0.6 and the transition will be 1 second with an ease of ease and out. And then in order for it to scale smoothly back down, we can add a transition of 1 second to cube small. When you try this out, you'll notice that there may be some inconsistency with how and when the cursor touches the small cube. Sometimes it will scale, sometimes it won't. Well, that's because the larger cube sometimes gets in the way. To fix this, we can do the following. Within cube small, we can set pointer events to be auto. This means that we want the element to react to pointer events such as hover. Then inside of the main cube class, we will set pointer events to be none. Now when we hover over it, the smaller cube will increase in size smoothly and then smoothly transition out once the cursor has been removed. And there we have it folks. We've now looked at ways we can utilize the three-dimensional world within CSS, from transformations to creating 3D shapes. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a subscribe and like. You can also reach out to me via Twitter or on the Discord server linked below. But otherwise, stay healthy, stay safe, and I hope to see you in the next video.